Hi everyone. Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Depending on where you are, I am Rashad Sanusi, technical support at Digital Grassroots, and I am thrilled to welcome you all to this session on digital inclusion. So for this session, I will share my screen before we start. Our session will uh, follow this outline. Let me share my screen. Okay, I want to share my screen. Sorry for that, I just want to share my screen. It's okay now, thank you. We can continue. So I am Rashad Sanusif, and I'm super happy to have you all for this session, for this session on digital inclusion. And this session will follow this outline. First, we will have the welcome and introduction. And after, we will have an introduction and a nice breakout before the panel discussion, where we have uh, four amazing speakers they will share their experience about digital inclusion in their own community. And after that, we will go for Q&A and participant insights before the closing remark. So as I was saying, I'm super happy to have you all today for this session. And I am here with my colleague, Anna, and we are happy to moderate this session. So to start, today we are back in on the journey to explore digital inclusion and how this intersects with uh, our participation in internet governance. So this session is about to know how uh, we are faced, how our community are facing uh, the barrier to access to internet, and also what are the challenges we are facing in our community about internet governance. So. By understanding, by understanding this challenge, we will be sure that we know how we can be more engaged in this space so we can have our voice heard and also know the challenge we are facing, facing at the grassroots level. So our aim today is to create an interactive and inclusive environment where everyone can be invited to share their own view and how we can break this barrier to help everybody to be engaged in internet governance. So I will invite Anna for the next part of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I've been having some issues with my uh, audio, so please let me know if you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you. Amazing. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for uh, to all of you for joining us, and as Rashad mentioned, um, navigating through through intersectional access and participation in internet governance, we recognize a vast area of barriers, notably impacting marginalized youth, and these challenges streaming from different uh, factors, social, economic, political, cultural, uh, and other contexts present distinct obstacles in different environments. And we believe that unpacking these factors is vital in enabling us to recognize and map solutions that fully grasp uh, the issue and also leverage our collective insight toward effective practices and policies. And to start this session on, on the note of a collaborative exploration, we invite you to, to share words or phrases that come to your mind when uh, you think about the barriers faced by the marginalized youth. Um, through the mentee, I'm going to screen share. Uh, Rashad, would you mind to stop screen sharing for a moment so I can screen share? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we invite you to join us in mentee um, and share some of your thoughts um, about this issue before we proceed to the uh, panel. Um, I believe you should be able to see my 
the screen. Um, so please use the code that you can see 1525-4103 and let us know your thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for, for contributing your ideas. So I, I can see that you already have quite, quite an array of, uh, of issues. And um, um, yeah, I think that this work cloud reflects the, the collective acknowledgement of these values. And also we can see how diverse they are. Uh, something that I was mentioning earlier that um, the intersection of different uh, factors and contexts that come into arena when we talk about inclusive participation um, and access. And this is something that we hope to discuss today during the panel uh, discussion with our amazing uh, speakers and to see how we can leverage this knowledge, um, uh, keeping in mind this, uh, this visualization and this map that we have um, on the screen and how we can navigate these issues to promote the, the meaningful participation of young people in internet governance across different contexts. And I will now give the word to Rasha to present our, our uh, uh, guest speakers that will dig deeper into this conversation and guide us through this discussion. Thank you, Anna. Uh, we will continue our session. And the next part is the, about the panel and we have for amazing speaker, and I will let them introduce themselves, but before I will introduce themselves shortly, and also let them to say something before I will give them the floor. So we have uh, Muhammad Atif Alin, he is from India, and he 
is currently engaged as a research analyst, analyst in TCS. And also he has a relevant background in research, consultancy, information technology and sustainability, and internet governance. Also we have Jewan Shon. She's a doctoral researcher at uh, Kashwek Institute of Technology with a passion for multi-stakeholder multi model in internet governance. She's also an ICANN fellow, an APNIC fellow, and also a PIGA fellow. We also have Tatiana Hongjo from Benin, an IT professional who works to protect. He, he, he fe, she advocates for women's rights, and also Tatania, Tatiana serves as a digital expert at the AU, AU Youth Corporation Hub, monitoring and advising development projects in IT. We also have Pavel. She, he works as a program officer at the Internet Education and Research Lab at uh, AIT in Thailand. He has been strongly involved in internet governance since, many, since 2019. So I will let them to introduce themselves better. So I will give the floor to Mohamed after Jiwan can continue and Tatiana and after Pavel. So Atif, over to you. Okay, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Rashad. And uh, I'm uh, really excited to be here on this panel to speak on digital access and inclusion. So is this uh, just an introductory remarks that we have to give or uh, is there any topic you, you have in mind? that? To yes, just introduction. Uh, uh, and I will guide you to the session to the panel after. So oh, okay, because you already gave such a nice uh, introduction of yeah, everyone. So I want you to uh, yeah. talk more about you before we continue. So okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, my name is Atif, and as uh, Rasha introduced me, I have uh, been working as a research analyst for Tata Consultancy Services, which is one of the major IT uh, consulting firm based in India, and it has offices across the world. So as in my current engagement, I am based out of uh, Sweden. I'm working in the Stockholm office of the TCS, where I research on the latest technologies uh, that, are, that have been evolving in the banking, in the retail, or in the innovative uh, uh, digital uh, sector, and how it can help business businesses to abridge the gap in bringing uh, modern technologies to, to the public and the fora. And uh, in my previous experience of uh, internet governance, uh, I have been working on various issues like privacy, digital divide, access, inclusion. And I also collaborated with Alexander Wohn Humboldt Institute of Internet Society recently in studying about the Vietnamese uh, uh, digital uh, inclusion sector and the state of farmers working in uh, Vietnam. So we did a holistic study on Southeast Asia countries where uh, digital uh, access has been minimum and uh, how to increase that, how digital new digital uh, technologies could, could act as lever is something we pondered about. And I would like to share those uh, insights as well uh, when uh, the discussions would go on during the deliberations of this session. So I'm excited for this session as it would not only uh, bring about how these uh, technologies uh, could help uh, all of us, which of course have been the discussion of IGF as always, but from a gender lens, from a youth lens, from, from a holistic uh, inclusion lens, how it could uh, manifest into something which can be a purpose uh, driven approach to help all the stakeholders that are there in the multi stakeholder approach uh, that is being given in the internet uh, uh, so, so sectors uh, domain is something i'm really excited to talk about so look forward to this interactive session thank you okay thank you so much atif i will let uh, jiwan to tell more about herself thank you jiwan Hey, I'm Jewan from Korea, and currently I'm based in Germany. I'm doing my PhD at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, 
before that, uh, my master was more focusing on uh, how do people assess in basic needs such as internet and water in developing countries. And now I'm more focusing on how do we engage more citizens and people in when we are making such a policies and development for the urban settings. So uh, I think my first uh, internet governance experience was when I joined APIGA, Asia Pacific Internet Governance uh, Program in Korea. And I think during that time I've learned um, how actually my work and research can be also related to internet governance because I think um, in Korea as a youth internet governance was not a familiar topic that everyone knows and um, I think it was a great opportunity for me to uh, learn about it and see uh, how internet issues are not only like technological concept itself but also linked to our um, daily life and social and environmental concepts so yeah i'm looking forward to talk with all the other speakers and see how can we also include more use and yeah increase more access in internet thank you okay thank you so much jiwon tatiana you have the floor Hi everyone, can you please confirm that you can hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, amazing. Hi everyone again, my name is Tatiana Rumjo. I'm from Benin Republic, which is a West African country. So greeting from Benin. If you come to Benin every day, every day or in West Africa, make sure you put Benin in your list of country to visit. Uh, so as Rashad said before, um, an IT professional, I work as an IT system and infrastructure engineer in a private company here in Benin, but also with branches in Ivory Coast, um, in Niger, and also in Togo. Basically, my everyday work focus on how to help businesses and also government to implement digitalization, digital tools, digital technologies as part of the processes. And uh, as part of this work, I'm happy to have work on various projects, including public e-services and so on in, in Benin. But besides my, I would say my cap as a professional, I'm also engaged in the internet governance ecosystem. This journey started in 2018 when I got selected for a fellowship, which is a Women DNS Academy Fellowship in Benin. Uh, because of this, it was like a five days of uh, training. And after that, I got engaged with Internet Society. And since then, I'm happy to have joined different projects, different programs. I also got became the program lead of the Women and Internet program. I'm happy to talk about that later in, as part of the discussion. And I also got elected to become the vice chair for a mandate of two, two years that finished few months ago. So thank you everyone. I'm happy to join you for this uh, for this discussion. And yeah, looking forward to to express more. Okay. Thank you so much. Tatiana, happy to have you here. I will let Pavel now to introduce himself. Um hi. Good afternoon to all. Uh, this is Pavel for the record. And uh, thank you, Rochelle, and thank you, Hannah, uh, for giving me this opportunity, of course, to uh, be a part of such an amazing cohort of members who will be talking about a very important session today. Um, as Rashad mentioned before, uh, I'm actually based in Thailand. Uh, I work as a program officer for the Internet Education and Research Lab at a university here called the Asian Institute of Technology, uh, AIT for short. Um, I, am, I actually have a very technical and academic background, but at times I also do wear the hat of civil society uh, as well. Um, and therefore I have been strongly involved in the Internet Governance Academy, I would say since APNIC 48 in 2019, as Rashad mentioned, um, at that time I was a conference fellow. It was also the first time I met J1, so uh, you know, fond memories. And since then, uh, I, you could say um, I didn't look back and I've been uh, part of several other exemplary fellowships as well, like ICANN and APGA back in 2021, and even um, INSIG, the Indian School of Internet Governance back in 2021, I believe. 
Um, and I've also been uh, an individual member of the AP RALA, which is the Asia uh, Pacific Regional at large. And I'm quite eager, I would say, to make valuable contributions to um, the internet ecosystem in the Asia Pacific region. And my passion for ICT and ICD for development is what drives me into striving for equal access to the internet for minority groups. And uh, as a result, I actively promote uh, inclusive internet and emphasize the importance of youth participation in the multi-stakeholder process. Uh, I'm glad that I got to be a part of digital grassroots uh, ambassadorship program back in, I believe, 2021 as well for cohort five. And that's how I got involved with digital grassroots. So thank you so much uh, to them and thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Pavel, as well. So, Anna, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rashad, and thank you to everyone for uh, for presenting themselves. Um, yeah, I believe that we have a, a very unique platform with so many experiences and backgrounds coming in together. So I'm really excited about uh, our discussion. I would like to start with a with a more general um, space, uh, and maybe you can share how do barriers to digital access and participation with participation in internet governance manifest in your own regions and context, particularly for disadvantaged um, uh, and underrepresented groups, and whether you've seen a strategy or a practice that has proven uh, or you've seen to be successful in increasing meaningful participation in young people in, uh, in internet governance. I think we can we can maintain this in order if uh, no one minds uh, here. So uh, is it back to me or like? Ah uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I would go the first one. So yeah, you raised a very pertinent concern uh, when you mentioned about the digital access and participation for especially the disadvantaged and underrepresented or the minority minority groups uh, uh, in our regions. So uh, especially speaking about my region, when it comes to meaningful and affordable access, it is still a very big challenge with millions still unconnected, uh, especially from the marginalized communities in different countries of uh, Asia, be it India, Vietnam, or uh, any Bangladesh, Pakistan. So they, they, there is an urgent need for multi-stakeholder dialogue to focus on providing infrastructure and access to all of them and to further enable the use of emergent technologies that have uh, become so famous as of now for the socioeconomic development as well. Uh, one of the studies to, uh, just to quote statistics, there was a study by MIT Sloan, uh, uh, and uh, as per that study, uh, inter internet penetration in rural India stands at roughly 29%, which means that over 700 million citizens are still living in the digital darkness. So we understand that universal and meaningful access deserves further consideration, and not it is not just limited to connectivity and infrastructure. It, it in, encompasses other aspects like digital literacy or uh, general access to information, which were uh, which I could see on the screen when uh, participants uh, uh, typed in the Menti uh, quiz run by the moderator here. So uh, it is important to adopt ways to measure uh, access and identify current uh, methods to empirically measure, track, assess, and evaluate the benefits from increasing access and inclusivity. And many companies, many private firms have uh, seen that when they do that, they have uh, seen a purpose-led uh, uh, driven growth in their uh, revenues as well. So we will talk about that part later. But uh, here I can say that with rapid development of emergent technologies, these technologies should provide an enabling platform for everyone to participate, to raise their voices and to partake in the benefits as well. When it comes to India, there have been several initiatives from the government of India, like Digital India, Skill India, which tries to abridge the access and uh, technology divide among the masses. 
and uh, uh, likewise there have been initiatives from private firms as well for example there was one initiative which was a big hit was uh, google's internet sathi initiative which uh, empowered female ambassadors to train and educate women in more than 3 lakh villages of india on the benefits of internet in their day to day lives so that was uh, one uh, uh, good initiative from google which uh, tried to bridge the connectivity gap by building a chain of women entrepreneurs and women farmers to uh, you know propagate the knowledge of internet among other uh, community members as well so there have been community initiatives with the help of private firms governments and other stakeholders in the uh, multi stakeholder group that we can see in asia pacific region so uh, that was uh, th- th- these were some of the examples uh, that i wanted to share also it's uh, important to understand that in an increasingly uh, interconnected society lack of access to internet can uh, tremendously impact day to day activities and uh, in the lure of making it more digitally we we might make some uh, actors uh, in, in in the uh, long run you know uh, uh who we can make them uh, a a loof of the uh, technical uh, uh, fruits that uh, that it can provide for example some organizations i was just uh, reading one report yesterday like some uh, government banks they withdrew the physical provision of services to push for web based services justifying closure of offices in small communities uh, i mean i'm sure some of us have seen in their countries also that many banks are uh, closing uh, their physical offices just to push for web based services so such decisions also affect the daily operation in lives of communities so there is a need to identify innovative approaches to connect the population in rem- remote and geographical uh, geographically inaccessible areas it's not just about uh, withdrawing physical offices and pushing for web based services because sometimes it hinders the overall uh, uh, overall success of uh, uh, you know giving out the digital services as well so when it uh, comes to uh, empirical parameters which should be considered here the first would be the technical uh, which is the distance and re- remoteness of the areas and other would be uh, adoption challenges as well there could be language barriers there could be a d- disability uh, the literacy rate uh, differs among uh, people of diverse age groups for for young people say 18 to 30 it is easy easy to you know caught, uh, get hold of those uh, web based uh, informative uh, Uh, technologies that have but for a person who is above 60 year o- years of age or above 70 years of age it is hard to you know get accustomed to those services which are not as new for him or which are not as exciting so we have to think of ways in which we can include those uh, those genders as well so in many areas with uh, no internet uh, or internet a uh, very bleak internet connect, uh, connectivity community radios uh, used to serve as a medium of communication so that can be uh, one area where we can think of how to you know bring community radios in an innovative manner to bring along other uh, other uh, people as well no, who are not only our age but uh, include them and skill them and educate them about how they can contribute to the digital fora and become uh, di- uh, digital ambassadors for their communities so uh, there have been technologies like uh, low earth uh, orbit satellites which are tools for cost effective internet access to remote and inaccessible areas so such uh, technologies also help the communication divide uh then i mentioned about a study of mit sloan there was one uh, industry leading integrator of digital networks called sterlite technologies which uh, collaborated with mit sloan india lab for helping uh, developing a business model for uh, for profit initiative with the goal of expanding uh, high speed internet connectivity in more than 20 villages of india and its target is to you know do this uh, across 3 lakh villages by 2024 so these are some uh, innovative approaches that have been going on in the rural areas but uh, along with these innovative approaches we, what we as youth can do that is also uh, a, a very important question as to bring along uh, a society which is just and cares about all so there there, there was one uh, 
a very motivational story that i came across in 2019 and uh, it made me also think up on the lines of uh, uh, internet governance which i would uh, like to share with you all so there was this man called carlos pereira who was uh, driven by the passion to empower people by enabling them to have uh, a voice he did something innovative through a mobile app so he was a computer scientist and his 10 year old daughter clara could not walk or talk because she was uh, born with uh, cerebral palsy which is uh, a group of disorder that affect a person's ability to move and maintain balance so basically to give his daughter a voice perera what he did was he quit his job as a computer scientist and developed an app to help her communicate that app was called levox the app's algorithms could uh, interpret motor cognitive and uh, visual disorders and it used uh, machine learning uh, algorithms to predict and understand and understand what the person would want or need so that levox app could be used by people living with a range of disabilities including be it uh, cerebral palsy or down syndrome or multiple sclerosis and or even a stroke so for clara the app had given her a voice that her do- his daughter when uh, her dad asked her what she wanted for breakfast the app recognized uh, his voice and gave clara the options on the screen allowing to uh, select what she wanted so that app also gives disabled children a more inclusive education for example if it is used at a school the software can hear a teacher's question and provide appropriate multiple choice answers for the students to select and uh, that app was named the best app by united nations best inclusion app in the world so if you can google more about it you will see that how multiple software companies adopted the idea behind the app and went on to bring on softwares which could be more inclusive so that is one example where an individual through his mind uh, could change uh, the holistic viewpoint of the society and uh, made people understand that how uh a gender divide or how people of other with disabilities could be brought into the uh, fore of uh, digital inclusion and in my panelists as well i see very erudite uh, computer engineers i'm sure across the board uh, in these participants they would be people with multiple uh, talents and skills who can you know think of innovative ideas to uh, for inclusion so that is something uh, i wanted to highlight and i would be happy to hear uh, the insights from other panelists as well yeah thank you um yeah i agree with many of your points so um yeah when i was thinking of what to say i was thinking of this uh, psychological theory about this maslow's hierarchy of needs i think many people knows it that like basic needs come first like food water then the psychological need and uh self fulfillment something like that i thought like yeah first we need the internet access to have our basic needs but then after that we need our digital inclusion and the right to participate as stakeholder and at the top of the hierarchy maybe we can think of like some ecological impact of the internet or sustainability as a long term and um yeah i think in korea why we have like strongest uh, like internet connection and many people are owning a smartphone and so on so i think we fulfill the first basic needs but however the second stage of having like stakeholder participation i think is um another stage that we have to achieve uh, because um yeah i believe since uh, internet the decision on making like how to do about this internet are influencing in so many factors and we really need to like hear from other people as well but um from my experience even in the like such high tech country um when it comes to the discussion about internet i think there are still a very few stakeholders who are having a say um so for example in when i was uh, joining this korea uh, internet governance uh, committee for managing the internet governance forum and so on after finishing the apiga um i was the only youth uh, who were there and also um yeah like beside me there were only like two or three people who were like female so mostly was the male it professors um who knows a lot and um i don't know if it's only like korea or asia but um 
the youth were considered as someone who doesn't know much, who should learn from the others. So that even though I might have a saying, they were not really like taking it seriously and say, uh, like, uh, I will tell you, you know. And so when the environment was set like this, I think even though I was trying to um, encourage some other youth who has finished this program together. Not many people were willing to join as they knew how will be the discussion environment like and they think when they cannot be heard anyway, what's the point of like going there and have a stay? Um, so I think there's also some um, cultural barriers that um, make us having a hard time um, having a say in this participation. But also um, I think um there some of the youth were having a hard time as um they are really stressed about getting a job in the future after they graduate and uh when they are not like directly ma uh, majoring in it they were afraid um even if what if i like spend so much time in internet governance and not being able to get a job um how will i be managed to like you know look for another job if my only activities has been in internet governance and so on so um many of the koreans who have finished this apiga program even though some of them got award and everything in the end they suddenly like quitted all the internet governance program as they like so ah, like since i do not have much ex uh, expertise in coding or so maybe still i cannot get a job in this so i should like switch to something else something like that so i think um it would have been really nice if we could have shared um like in a soft scale or in like some indirect way how can like involving internet governance actually can also benefit them because um, for me, even though I'm like not like majoring in IT or so, I think many of the like skills that I've learned throughout the internet governance really benefited me in research and many perspectives. Um, for example, I think by learning about uh, the importance of multi-stakeholders um, and like paternal approach and so on, I think I was also been able to or see like how can I involve in into my research. Uh, doing more surveys to the public and trying to do some stakeholder interview to include them in the decision making process. And I think it's not only about like um, computer science or so on. Um, so yeah, I wonder why um, it was either A or B. And yeah, also I think um, when people, I think before COVID, we were usually like expected to be uh, at this forum in person and so on but uh, i think many people had a hard time like yeah asking their supervisors or professor if they can have a leave for such an event where not many koreans were understanding what is even internet governance about so i think uh to continue their journey um i think it's really beneficial if more will be able to know what actually internet governance is and I think we have like quite a long way to go about many people understanding about it and also giving them a more opportunity in participating regardless of uh, major or background, then then we will get to think about some of these uh, environmental impact or sustainability. Yeah, I will stop now. Tatiana, you want to say something? You can. Yes, okay. I can do this. Uh, thank you, Joan and Mohamed, for for already putting so many things on the table so far. I think talking about the inclusion and participation of young people in the internet governance ecosystem, we we need to think about a way to federate many initiatives together. Because when you talk about inclusion of youth and also the engagement in this kind of uh, topic, in this kind of uh, discussion, the question is, do they have the access? Do they have the information about this? Do they, are they using the internet? J1, I'm so happy that you talk about the needs of young people to be able to, you know, surpass the, the way of 
saying, okay, I don't have a job, I don't know how to eat, I don't know how to wear something, because I cannot be engaging in discussion. Today we are here for like one hour, one hour and a half discussion. But the young people who doesn't know what to eat today at lunch or what to eat at dinner, I'm sure he won't be interested in coming to here on this table to talk about something like that. That's one point. We, all, we need as internet governance ecosystem to partner with initiatives that are making sure young people are able to sustain themselves. That's one point. Another point is the meaningful access. What we realize is that every day we have usually the same people coming this every year to talk about the same thing. The question is, how do we make sure that this information, this knowledge, this capacity, these skills are spread outside of the general, I would, I would say the immediate network that we are part about? How different organizations are part of civil society organization? How are we making sure that people in rural area are part of this discussion? How do we make sure that people who are living with a disability are being part of this discussion? How do we make sure that young people are sitting on the decision-making table? How are we making sure they are part of the decision-making processes? And as Internet Society, we had this idea who started, I think, in 2018 or 2019. The name of the project is Fab A Internet. In English, it is Women and Internet. And the basic idea behind this program or project is to make sure female women in the internet governance ecosystem are sitting or are taking leadership position in the system. Because we, we, we get to the point that we realize that there is only a uh, male participant when we come to uh, the IGF, when we come to the uh, DNS forum, when we come to many forums we organize here in Benin, or also even training, basic training. We have only male people coming here, coming there just for the training, or also part of the training, or uh, organizing the training process. So we, we launched this program and it has been ongoing until 2022. And we are happy to see now that women are now more interested about this discussion, about this topic. And that's one thing we need to think about. And also as part of bridging the digital divide, because I'm sure that in countries, in other countries, as well as in Benin, there is this divide uh, between people who has access to the information, people who do not have access to the information, people who have the skills to be online, to be interacting, to be using internet efficiently, and people who do not have the skills. So there is a really and a strong divide between both of these people. So we launched this program, which is uh, Eniola, and it is a platform who has this uh, capability to be downloaded offline. So even if the person do not have a very reliable internet access, you can still access to those sources and to those, you know, information, interact with other people from other regions on the in the countries. Unfortunately, we this project didn't go uh, further because there was a lack of support. If you want to do something uh, as part of training, as part of and making sure it's part of the education process, we need the support of the government. That's one thing. We also need the support of the private companies, of the internet service provider. So I think talking about uh, digital inclusion of young people in internet ecosystem, there is a need to federate many initiatives together and make them communicate. But this should be done in a way that we think sustainability as part of the process. One thing is to, to be launching initiative and another thing is to make sure that, it, that these initiatives are sustainable and can, long, can, be, can have an impact on the long term. And another thing I need to, to talk about is the is the lack of data, the lack of meaningful data that we, we need to 
focused on, we need to take action on. If I need to start a project, if an organization needs to start a project, or if a private company needs to support an organization who is working with young people or support a young people who is working on, on various topics, the question is, how am I, how me as partner, am I make, I'm, I'm sure that what I'm supporting is what is going to create an impact on the community, what is going to have a tangible impact on the society in general. So there is a need for uh, for young people first, but also from the, you know, the statistic uh, agencies in every country to provide data that we can post and that we can use in order to make sure that the projects we are working on are going the way we want them to go. Uh, as Internet Society, we launched a project in 2020, which is internet.bg. And the, this project is in two different, I would say two different parts. The first part is to reconstitute the history of internet in Benin at one point. And the second part is to have a big platform uh, which is communicating on, on real time with the different internet society, internet providers in Benin. We have in Benin, we have MTN, we have Moon, we have Celtis, and we also have the optical fiber provider like SBIN. And the, the idea behind this project is to, to have a platform when we see how internet is working in different areas of the countries, how many people are using them on a daily basis, how many people are using internet in Cotonou, how many people are using internet in Paraku, in Natitengu, and also, what, how are they, I mean, when, how are they using this internet? Are they using the mobile phone or are they using the optical fiber? Are they using the, the BLR or, so these are data we are, we are trying to work as part of this project. And yeah, I think talking about the inclusion of young people again, is come, it's not something we can tackle as, just on one initiative or one project, but it has to be something uh, that we think broad about, we think sustainable about, and we need to uh, partner together, we need to work together and make sure that one and other, we are trying to work toward the same goal. Thank you. Um, all right. Hi again, this is Pavel for the record. Um, I guess the benefit of going last is uh, Atif, J1, and Tatiana has pretty much checked all the boxes on uh, what I would like to talk about, but it, it makes my job easier, though. Um, so, I, so I am based in Thailand, but I'm originally from Bangladesh, so I'd like to spotlight a little bit about the barriers that we face in Bangladesh, the barriers to digital access and the participation for disadvantaged and underrepresented groups. Um, especially the youth, which are multifaceted. And these challenges manifest in several ways, but I'll keep it short due to the time limitations. Um, there are four barriers which I feel are significant to address. The first being the limited infrastructure. So in many rural areas of Bangladesh, the lack of proper internet infrastructure remains a significant barrier. People in these areas often struggle with slow or unreliable connections or carrier services are reluctant to uh, go and set up for, uh, go and set up phone towers in these areas because they simply do not have the the infrastructure to set them up in these remote areas. The second barrier that I would like to talk about, which is very important to address in the modern world, is the affordability factor. So even though the internet has been a basic human right now, but the cost of internet access can be really prohibitive to Bangladeshis in general, and of course the Bangladeshi youth, particularly those in the low income and marginalized communities. Uh, and even though Bangladesh has adopted many affordable data plans and devices as well, um, they have only played a they have only played a percentage uh of they've only been beneficial to a percentage and not really covered the broader side of accessibility for uh, the people and 
thirdly, of course, we have to address digital literacy because a lack of digital literacy and awareness is a significant challenge. And many individuals, especially in rural areas, lack the skills and knowledge to use internet effectively. There is still, you'd be surprised, some people who forget the internet, they probably have never seen a computer before. And to them, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't affect their lives in any way, but it is for us to go and make them aware that this should be affecting their lives. And finally, the language barrier. So, you know, while Bengali, or I would say Bangla, is the primary language spoken in Bangladesh, not all of the content that is online and available is in Bangla. And although there has been a lot of push for universal access in the last few years, the language barrier can actually limit access to information and services for those who aren't proficient in English. And if somebody, if a youth or if a marginalized community is okay with not learning English, what can we do, right? This is, so this is where we have to come up with these successful strategies. You know, we have to overcome these barriers. And the Bangladesh government has been doing uh, something similar. They have an initiative for the past decade or two decades, actually, it's called Digital Bangladesh. Similar to what Atif mentioned about Digital India, you know, the, the government-led program aims to address the digital inclusion by, by providing the various services and promoting digital literacy. And there's this one particular project they have, and it's called Info Ladies. So basically, it's an initiative where trained women travel to rural areas with their bicycles and with internet equipped laptops to provide information and services to local communities. And you know, these, uh, this initiative was, uh, was I think started back in 2013, so it's been 10 years now. And they have played a crucial role in improving digital access and literacy for not just marginalized communities, but for youth who probably would have uh, never been aware of how the internet affects them or how they can contribute to the internet community. And additionally, we also have another project, which is a mobile financial service, such as Bcash. Uh, and it has, been, it has made it easier for people, even who don't have a traditional bank account, to engage in digital, digital transactions, just to show them that just because you don't have a bank account doesn't mean you, can, you cannot still use the, the, the internet to make transactions with your finances. So this fosters economic inclusion as well. And you know, there have been other efforts to improve digital Bangladesh or digital access in Bangladesh, which are ongoing. And yes, there will be challenges. Challenges still persist and we have a long way to go. And I think this is probably the third decade that digital Bangladesh has been working on. But um, we have made some significant strides in bridging the digital divide and promoting inclusivity. But this is still the start. This is still the beginning and we have a long way to go. Back to you, Russia. Thank you so much, Pavel, Tatiana, Jiwan, and Atif for the great contribution. I really enjoy uh, hearing you. And now we go to the Q&A session. And also, if some people want to share some idea or insight, we are happy to hear them. I don't know. You can raise your hand also as well. Uh, we have a one question from a community member who's uh, watching us online. Uh, John, and he's asking you, um, it's a question to all uh, panelists, and he's saying thank you so much for sharing the perspective. And his question is, how can we uh, streamline the cooperation between different sectors uh, to advance this, um, uh, to advance the inclusion and participation of young people in internet governance? He's saying that there were some uh, successful initiatives mentioned uh, by uh, Atif and Pavel, um, about the private sector and government uh, boosting the participation and inclusion issues and how we can advance that uh, and make sure that there is a true multi-stakeholder approach in, uh, in these solutions. Uh, 
I think I can just go ahead and answer this first and I can uh, pass it on to Atif afterwards. Um, so if I have to say it from an academic, and sorry, an academic perspective, um, educational institutions obviously play a significant role in um, reducing the digital divide and nurturing internet governance, literacy, and leadership among youth. Um, the way I see it, digital literacy education, we talk so much about it. We, we push so much for digital li literacy, but are academic institutions doing enough? Because yes, they are instrumental in equipping students with essential digital skills. But if you go and check any um, in university, is there a specific course where they're teaching internet governance? Like what is internet governance? Do, do the students actually know what internet governance is? Um, they're in a world where internet governance is affecting so much of their daily livelihoods and they're on the internet 24 seven, but how much of it, how much of the skills do they have to navigate the online world and understand the, implement, in the implications of their digital actions. So, you know, through structured programs, I believe students can actually gain a more proficient understanding of how they should put themselves online. We are lucky to live in a, in a world where, you know, research and data is so advanced that academia contributes to our understanding of the digital divide through research and data. There are people who are going around making, creating surveys and and, and conducting surveys uh, and research, which helps us under, understand and identify the gaps in internet access and usage, which in return then makes, helps in, uh, inform the policymakers and organizations how they should structure and make their informed decisions. So this is another, another thing, I believe, the research and data capabilities of academia to implement uh, policy development, of course. And finally, as we keep pushing, we talk about youth engagement. So the university itself cannot just have a course, right? There has to be youth who are, who want to, out of their own self, want to engage and talk about internet governance with their peers. Academic, institu ac academic institutions can provide a platform and you know this can actually include hosting forums, clubs, and events related to digital inclusion and governance. And what this does is actually it fosters leadership and helps students understand how they should be advocating for their rights online. So yeah, these are some of the points I believe uh, can answer the question that uh, uh, that has been asked and. Yeah. I guess, Atif, you can go ahead and speak a little bit more. Yeah, I think I agree with uh, Pavel. And uh, from an academia point of view, he has, uh, I mean, already stated what needs to be done to foster more participation in order to include people. So from a private perspective, uh, I think the question was that how can uh, more uh, uh, partnerships be made to cater to inclusion and digital activities. So I can say that uh, it is not, uh, I, it is very difficult for any private entity to do on its own. Okay, it, it can take one uh, initiative. So for even a company like Google, which is headquartered in the United States of America, in order to implement its internet Sathi program, it had to consult the government of India and it had to collaborate with another company called Facebook to implement that, to deploy that program into around three lakh villages. So it's an it's not an easy task. And especially as, as young entrepreneurs, you guys should seek to different modes of uh, partnerships that is available to you. And that can come through guidance from academia as Pavel has stressed upon. And it can also come by taking active participation in various uh, internet government schools that are there. There's a uh, for-profit uh, entity called uh, Internet Society. There's Internet Foundation, which calls for every uh, every six months, it calls for people to submit a project proposal. So that also answers the question of Joshua, 
which she has on how to source for funding i think tatiana can also give her inputs but there are many calls from entities like ngos or like internet society there are hackathons uh, if you are in the it industry uh, from many major it software firms which you can uh, project your uh, 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 project uh, project your ideas and you can win some ransom money and take your projects forward so there have been these initiatives yeah. and uh, i think i think other people can also put yeah we are running out of the time so thank you atif and thank yeah. you everyone i think uh, for further discussion we can stay in touch and you can send your question as well for us so we can see how we can help as well so I want to thank uh, Pavel, Tatiana, Jiwon, and Atif, and all the people who participated to this session. We learned a lot about how we can tackle digital inclusion, and digital inclusion is a complex issue, but we can do more for it. And thank you all for the participation, and I hope to see you for the future engagement as well. Thank you, and have a good day. Bye. Thank you so much, Thank you. Russia. Yeah.